Thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, and to the thank you to the Electoral Integrity Project for being so supportive of the Global Network for securing electoral integrity and giving us the space to talk about the Global Network, introduce it to you all during this really wonderful annual event that the EAIP hosts. Uh, in this round table, we'll be introducing the network uh, and our ongoing work around election management body independence. But first, a few quick words of introduction for our round table. Uh, my name is Erica Schein. I'm the Managing Director of the Center for Applied Research and Learning at the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, or IFAS. Uh, Ambar Zoberi will be my co-moderator today. She's Senior Elections Advisor on the Elections and Political Processes team in USAID's Bureau for Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance. Tom Rogers has been the Australian Election Commissioner since 2014, and was previously the Deputy Electoral Commissioner and the Australian Electoral Commission State Manager for New South Wales, and we're so pleased he's joining us. Uh, Dr. Stefan Darnoff is my colleague at IFAS. He's our Senior Global Advisor, Electoral Operations and Administration. He was formerly IFAS Country Director in Zimbabwe, Cambodia, Nepal, Moldova, and Pakistan and International Election Commissioner for Afghanistan's 2005 parliamentary elections. Uh, Dr. Akhtail Nieto Vasquez is an independent political consultant, but also executive undersecretary of Red Oi, the Inter-American Network for Election Observation and Electoral Integrity. And then last but not least, Dr. Toby James, Professor of Politics and Public Policy at the University of East Anglia and co-director of our host, the Electoral Integrity Project. I'll now turn over to my co-moderator, Ambar, to introduce to everyone who's not familiar with it, the Global Network for Securing Electoral Integrity. Thanks so much, Erica, and good afternoon and good evening to everybody. I come to you from this dimly lit hotel room in Colombo, as I apologize in advance for the mood lighting. Um, I've also got a bit of a cold, as you can probably hear, so hopefully I won't have any coughing fits, but I'm apologizing in advance for that as well, um, in case I do. So I'm very happy to join the panel today to talk about the Global Network for Securing Electoral Integrity, the products we're developing also that are relevant to today's conversation. So as Eric has mentioned, I will go ahead and introduce the network itself. Um, for those of you who don't know about it, it's one of the initiatives that arose from the first Summit for Democracy, which was held in 2021. Um, post that um, the world's leading organizations that work to support election integrity came together to establish for the first time a standing platform for regular collaboration between a diverse set of partners to work together to modernize our election approaches. So this is the Global Network for Securing Electoral Integrity or GINSEI as we lovingly call it within the GINSEI family. Um, USAID is proud to be a part of the network which launched in March of 2023 Thus far, we have about 29 um, active partners, which include intergovernmental bodies, donor agencies, international and non-governmental organizations, and election-related networks from around the world. Uh, many of the part, uh, people who are on the uh, panel today, including um, people from IFAS and RIDOI and AEC, through its membership in the uh, regional network, Pianzea, are also part of the network. Um, the network is serving as a community of practice. We're hoping to revitalize conversations and approaches which promote a consistent set of norms for what constitutes transparent, competitive, inclusive, and peaceful elections, basically elections that we hope will reflect the will of all people. The network recognizes that we really need to work together to advocate for global election norms and be united in taking actions to advance election integrity. This requires us to assess or reassess our existing assumptions, our existing approaches and principles and practices and norms. In particular, I think this is an area where academia really could um, work closely with implementers to really take stock of where we are, what the evidence shows us so that we can base action in evidence. And hopefully Toby will get a chance to touch on this a little bit more in the discussion today. So what does GINSEI do? GINSEI has set two goals for itself. The first is to strengthen the election integrity norms framework, and the second is to provide a standing platform for an expanded network of actors to promote and defend electoral integrity. So as part of the first objective, the network is seeking to promote awareness and adherence to existing norms and good practices 
because we know there are many good ones out there already, um, but also to look, think about developing new norms where there might be gaps, and then also actively advocating for new or renewed commitments and actions were needed. So as Jinsei was being formed um, over the last year, the network collectively decided that there are a whole host of uh, election integrity issues we could focus on, but we wanted to keep it manageable and we thought to choose two initial issues um, where we could support the election integrity norms framework. So we debated the many issues we could focus on and then voted to pick two um, top priority issues and we decided um, the, we first determined which criteria we'd use to choose the issues to focus on. Um, and we had three main criteria, and that was that the issue should warrant attention because of the threat to election integrity, that the issue is one on which forward movement or impact is realistic, uh, and that the issue is one where there's a comparative advantage for a group of actors within a network, such as Jinsei, to work on, as opposed to individual organizations working on it. Um, and then the network would be able to engage in ways such as advocacy, norm setting, or convening cross-sectoral discussion forums. So the two issues that the, that the network ultimately chose were safeguarding the independence of EMBs, specifically focused on the risks or benefits when they have to interact with other public uh, institutions, which is an area where that men, the members of the network felt was understudied, but is of pressing concern. And, and the second issue that was chosen was promoting democratic electoral reform processes, but for today's um, purposes, we will focus particularly on, on the topic of safeguarding the independence, independence of election management bodies. Once the issues were chosen, Jinsei kicked off working groups, um, which developed an initial concept to outline what we thought, where we thought there might be gaps um, and to refine the issue we wanted to delve in on. We felt general EMB autonomy and independence has been studied. There's work out there on it. There are recommendations and best practices in that space. But where we thought we could further focus was a space where EMB independence might be challenged when the election administration must work with other governmental bodies, which we know in its work is pretty common practice. So after defining the issue a bit further, Jinsei's working group outlined a process to conduct consultations with the election integrity community. And so between January and February of this year, um, the working group held consultations with a broad set of key stakeholders to gather input to inform the development of a guideline, guideline document. Working group members divided up the work, um, USAID, International IDEA, IFAS, the National Democratic Institute, Rodoy and the Carter Center conducted consultations with stakeholders using a variety of methods, um, such as one-on-one -on -one consultations, virtual group consultations, online questionnaires, to name a few of the methods. So to develop a first draft, we engaged 12 election management bodies about 23 international NGOs and observer groups and networks, and nine intergovernmental and donor agencies for about a, 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 un, a total of about 44 unique um, entities that we were able to, to interview. Following the consultations, we pulled together all the consultation notes and tried to parse out the key takeaways to develop a very draft version of the guidelines that hopefully you had a chance to see, but if not, they are I think they are available um, for, for you all to to take a look at. The guidelines were presented at a workshop sponsored by International IDEA and USAID in Stockholm in March. The feedback we received at the workshop helped us to further refine our thoughts, improve the guidelines document, and then this was shared with the broader Jinsei network and other election experts for further input. So we've now arrived at the almost final version of the guidelines. We hope these will be final soon. Um, and I'll now turn it over to Erica to um, summarize the document. Over to you, Erica. Thanks, Ambar. Um, and I think as Ambar is going to put up just a few slides um, to kind of give you a sense of, of what I'm talking about here. And as she mentioned, um, the EIP helpfully put the draft guidelines. They're up on the event webpage. Kind of if you scroll down in the program, you'll you can click on them so you can see them. Um, they're not final, but I think they're fairly close to to where they'll be when we when we ultimately launch them. Um, so you're Erica, welcome. can I can I just ask, um, I'm having, our, I can't seem to share it since only one participant can share at a time. So it's okay. not letting me pull up anything. Okay. Um, oh, hold on. I think maybe I've got it now. Sure. One second. We have a little time. I'll, I'll, I'll get started because the slides aren't needed quite yet. Um, and, and if you can't do it, I'll, I will try. Um, but there you go. Okay. Thanks. 
So um, our starting point for this effort, which Umbar mentioned, is that the nature of independence of EMBs, I'll just use this short, the short version, is changing. Both the community, our community's understanding of what it means to be independent, but also the threats and the challenges that EMBs face as they try to exercise their independence. So on this first point, while we, I think, acknowledge that independence is the ideal and an institution may be legally independent, interdependence is more the reality. EMBs, however independent, do not and cannot operate alone. Um, regardless of their legal mandate, the type of structure, distribution of re responsibilities across organizations um, in a given election context, there will be points of collaboration between the EMB and other agencies, whether for information sharing, carrying out specific election processes, or managing a crisis. Um, ideally, this interdependence would not impinge on an EMB's ability to behave independently and impartially. What does this mean? It means in sort of this ideal case that all stakeholders have a shared understanding, shared commitment, and no political agenda. That's the ideal. Um, the type of interdependencies that we're talking about, and we, we sort of lay this out in the preamble, um, include things like collaboration with security agencies to ensure physical security of workers and voters, uh, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on accreditation of international observers and out-of-country voting, health agencies on protocols for voting while in quarantine, uh, or cybersecurity agencies on protecting the electoral process from cyber threats and incursions. Um, I'm sure you can, you know, think of a whole other um, host of collaborative or points of collaboration between the EMB, but these are just a few examples. Um, so on the second point, um, and this is where the slide comes in, our consultations highlighted significant potential threats to EMBs threats specifically to their independence from their engagements or their interdependencies with other state actors and agencies. And this is where we're going to ask um, our roundtable participants to talk about in their experience. But broadly speaking, um, these threats include insufficient transparency that leads to accusations of partisanship, uh, ambiguity of mandates and authorities across the election process, um, usurpation of power by agencies that should uh, only be playing a supportive role in the electoral process, and operational inefficiencies and opportunities for interference that kind of can hold up what is always, of course, a very tight timeline for elections. Um, but we'd be remiss in not highlighting that some of the benefits from these engagements that came out in our consultations in some contexts. Um, you may have sort of good trust building operational efficiencies from being able to draw on different parts of government to run an election um, and enabling of a whole of government approach to safeguarding electoral integrity, for example, around maybe a disinformation problem. Um, so the draft guidelines structurally, what they look like is they start with a preamble. It sets out kind of what I've gone over, these major principles detailing our understanding about what independence should look like and what interdependence means, the key threats EMBs face, um, and then detailed guidelines by stakeholder group to help support EMB independence and its engagements with other state agencies. Um, these are listed on the next slide, Ambar, but... Um, We've included as stakeholder groups, we have different sections for the, of course, the EMBs. This is not exactly the order that they appear in the guidelines, but starting with the EMBs, the other public institutions that we're talking about, um, uh, the legislature, CSOs, political parties, the media, and the international community. So we've tried to frame recommendations or guidelines for each of those groups. Um, the guidelines touch on a number of things. I, just to kind of summarize them, we're talking about clarity of mandates and authorities, transparency and access to information for the public, uh, proactive information sharing among government agencies, uh, developing and publicizing memoranda of understanding in terms of engagement, knowledge sharing and networking, and then um, public public reinforcement and support for the independence of election management bodies. So my last two slides um, just kind of give one illustration of how we approach the different stakeholder groups. Um, so on this particular slide, we're looking at kind of um, oversight and participation in the process and how can each group in our guidelines, how can they support that with a view to enabling EMB independence? So for the legislature, um, we're talking about 
uh, sort of enacting laws that safeguard the necessary freedoms of speech, assembly, and press to encourage civil society and the media to participate actively and effectively in elections, um, including good, good reporting and oversight and education of voters. So that's the legislature's role on that front. Um, the EMB itself, it's about convening electoral stakeholders, giving them the opportunity to build understanding about how an EMB works with other institutions, and of course, providing timely and appropriate access and accreditation for observation and oversight. For other public institutions, um, the relevant guideline here is that they should make relevant data sets and information available to the public to enable this kind of oversight. Um, this is the next slide, civil society. Uh, this one is about observing and reporting fairly on the electoral process. And for political parties, encouraging their members, their activists to take advantage of opportunities to engage with the EMB and other agencies. Uh, for media, this is about reporting accurately and effectively uh, and serving really as a channel for accountability. And finally, the international community, um, providing support for local partners, um, as they advocate for legal reforms, as they engage in observation and oversight. So that's just a sampling. There's a lot of other guidelines in there. Uh, we welcome feedback on that today, but we also welcome it um, in future as we're finalizing them. Okay, so we're going to switch over to the interesting bit, which is talking to our roundtable participants. Um, we are going to have a bit of a kind of back and forth question and answer before we open up for all of your uh, questions, comments, and feedback. Um, so I'm going to kind of do this thematically. I'm going to start. We 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 tend to talk a lot about threats, of course. That's that's where we are. Where we produce these guidelines to address threats. But before we kind of go to that dark side, I wanted to talk just a little bit about. Um, or maybe explore a little bit some of these benefits of collaboration that we're talking about. So I'm going to turn first to Commissioner Rogers um, and ask, since the AAC as an election commission has worked, obviously, effectively with other public institutions around the electoral process, can you talk a little bit about what you've seen are the benefits to that kind of collaboration in your view? Mm, thanks, Eric. I hope you can hear me. Uh, and such an important topic. Um, may I also just uh, apologize. I too have a very uh, a small cold, which is why I'm continuing to blow my nose. So just forgive me for that as we're talking. Uh, look, it's critical. I, I, I mean, there's no way that in the modern era, election management bo bodies can operate in a bubble and deliver the services that we need to deliver to reach into the community uh, in a way that provides community support. <laughs> Um, and, and meets community expectations for service delivery. It's just so critical, I can't begin to uh, talk about the importance of that. And I thought I might just use one example. And Eric, I, I don't want to um, talk for too long. If I've got time, I'm just gonna use two very quick examples. First of all, we've just done a referendum on indigenous recognition in our constitution, which, which uh, didn't get up, but uh, we worked closely with the government agency called the National Indigenous Australians Agency. Uh, to really better understand how we could reach into Indigenous communities, to also use their networks, which was critical for us to be able to work out um, how best to position our message, to work with community leaders, uh, to also engage across Australia with very senior Indigenous Australians to try and provide a service uh, that we could reach into those communities. Now, we have to be very careful with this because if you're too associated with an agency, that was associated with voting in one particular way, it could well undercut um, the, the integrity and the independence of, of us as an EMB, but managed carefully, it provided untold benefits that we wouldn't have otherwise have been able to, got, to get to make sure that we were connecting ourselves with the community. And, and the second example I wanted to use is just a practical one. During the 2022 election that we ran, which was our big COVID election, uh, we delivered telephone voting services to, I uh, forget the number, but it was nudging up towards about 100,000 Australians. We used the government, Australian Government Services Australia organisation. We They helped us repurpose 6,000 full-time public servants to deliver that telephone voting service. It was hugely resource intensive. And again, you, you could view it if you were really 
strictly looking at that sort of division of independence that you wouldn't want government involved in the delivery of part of the voting service. But had we not had that, there would have been probably 100,000 Australians who would have been disenfranchised. So I know we're going to get on to the threats later on and the need to maintain that independence, but we see that done properly, the benefits to the community are huge. Uh, they also assist in cost reduction. I know that's um, you know, a very minor issue, but it's important. But for us, the benefits of collaborating, and I've picked two government agencies, we collaborate with others as well. It's a really important makeup of who we are. So. That's a really great illustration. Thank you. Because obviously you're talking about operational efficiencies, cost reduction, which is, is one of the things that kind of our consultations highlighted. But this issue of, of enfranchisement, this issue of inclusion is one that didn't come up as often. And I think that's really interesting and important. Um, so really appreciate that example. And I hope, I don't know, maybe, maybe some others in the group have other examples like that, that they can talk about later. Um, but so we will then switch gears, as you said, um, and I think I will move to Stefan and say, Stefan, from what you've seen over the years, and I listed some of the many countries that Stefan has worked in over the years, um, what do you see as the primary threats, kind of our starting point for the threats to EMB independence in, inherent to their collaboration uh, with other parts of government? Yeah, thank you very much for, for a, a, a great question. And thank you so much to EAP for, for organizing this. I think this is very, very timely. And before answering your question, I think a lot of things have been learned over the last couple of years from the COVID uh, pandemic. You know, before that, we didn't really look at the collaboration between EMB and, and, and sort of other state agency as much as, as became obvious during the the COVID when a lot of these uh, task force being established. So what I'm talking about now is primarily related to how EMBs have been engaged with uh, with these various uh, multi-agency task forces uh, during the the COVID. I was also a part of the the COVID commission out of out of Ukraine, a bit of an unusual one where they had internationals being part of that task force, but that's for a for a different story and a different day. Um, when it comes to working with other state agencies, I mean the obvious one for us within the election community is the perception, you know, that you have to deal with perception is so important. But for a lot of the other state agencies that might for the first time be involved in the elections, they don't think about perception. It's like, what is that? It's like an alien concept to them. And, and they don't need, they don't understand or appreciate the challenges associated with managing the threats that comes out of out of a, a perception of risk or threats to to independence. But let me mention a few more operational related risks that I've I've come across. And in some of these COVID task forces, often the Ministry of Health was the, the lead agency and had a lead in, in it. And the election authority might have been just a member, sometimes even a junior member of, of this committee. And since a Minister of Health official's perception or understanding of elections was that, well, elections are three months out, so we don't really need to make, make some of these decisions or rulings when it comes to uh, things that might impact elections, not understanding that from the election administration perspective, they are running out of time already. So getting timely decision out of a, a, a joint multi-agency task force when they're not, when the MB is not in the lead can prove a significant threat to its operational capacity or ability to deliver on the, the elections. Sometimes also, to be a bit blunt, um, other state agencies are a bit politically naive. You know, they don't understand how uh, improving access to polling might have political connotations or being perceived to benefit one over the other and is not uh, integrated that in, into the risk calculus that the, uh, that the joint agencies is doing. Uh, we're also having that a number of these agencies are not used to that you need to make swift decision and you need to be able to alter the course midway. 
these are often state bureaucracies that are slow and that's the the tempo that they're used to dealing with be that if you're mid-level or a senior officer at them and that is not conducive again to deliver on 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 elections but also looking at the team that's really making up a joint task force the importance i think it was mentioned by earlier that the importance of having an mou in place so it's public people know what is the mandate of this task force so so uh, be that voters be the parties or observers knows what to expect out of a a joint group like like this but this group also need to have their standard operating procedures and they need to be able to communicate what they're doing or not doing in in that one yeah, and I will talk uh, later on a bit more about um, communication, 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 because that's so so critical to uh, handle threats. But I I stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Stefan. Really helpful. Um, and and sort of so you're you're kind of coming at this from the perspective of someone who's worked closely with um, election management bodies. And so I would like to add on there. I'd like to turn to Octayal and. Uh, ask you from kind of the perspective of an election observer, you've, you've observed a lot of elections and um, obviously Red Oi does as well. So can you give us kind of any other notable examples of threats to EMB independence from their collaboration with other state agencies that you've observed? I think you're still muted. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, I might start with uh, one example from within the Latin American region, which is um, for those who are unfamiliar, uh, we have uh, several agencies who consti constitute the election systems and the election administrations. Uh, and coming back to the example of uh, Commissioner Rogers about uh, thinking themselves, uh, EMB thinking themselves in a bubble, uh, sometimes the problem or the challenge might start with a challenge comes from within the bubble. Because in this context, um, you, you, you have to coordinate agencies. You've got, well, from one side, a tribunal, election tribunal, on the other side, uh, the election administration uh, agency. And sometimes they have to coordinate be between them uh, to deliver the elections, especially when you've got to work with thousands of people within context of distrust uh, of political distrust and institutional distrust, uh, it comes as a challenge that in some cases can turn into a threat for delivering, for generating legitimacy amongst uh, not only political parties, but also stakeholders. So within complexity of the institutional design, uh, when, when you go to the ground and to observe elections, is when you start seeing uh, the variety of uh, problems that they might face, but most of them come from the top decisions, from the, uh, 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 the problems they face, the different ideas. Um, and the other problem that you might face in this context is that the high, highly legalistic approaches that uh, everything has to be placed in law and uh, everything, everything has to be uh, made by certain uh, regulations. And sometimes the regulations do not illustrate quite well what happens in the ground. And when you go to the ground, sometimes uh, election officials or even other stakeholders, they, they do what they can, with whatever they need. Um, so this um, tension between what is uh, written in the law and what happens in the ground sometimes uh, generates distrust, distrust in institutions. And on the other hand, they might um, create some atmospheres of illegitimacy, especially when it comes to the election results. I think this is uh, one example that we can find quite often, not just uh, within the Latin American region, but in other contexts, and can be reproduced in those uh, countries with highly decentralized uh, election systems and EMBs, especially those at a subnational level and uh, at a very local level, uh, such as uh, America and the UK. Uh, that's an example I can uh, tell you now. 
Thank you. And that's really helpful for introducing another threat um, or another issue, which is complexity and maybe rigidity in the law that doesn't reflect the reality of how elections are operating on the ground, how these relationships are working. So I think that's really another really useful contextual point. So I think kind of given all of that kind of background about why, why we care about this issue, why it's important, I want to turn to like the good strategies. What, what have we seen that works? Um, so I'm going to come back to Stefan. I'm going to give Stefan a two-part question just to challenge him a little bit. Um, one is, can you give us an example or two um, where an EMB has succeeded in this issue? They've like really asserted their independence while they were navigating some of these tricky relationships. And then the second part is, if you can only pick one thing, what is the most important thing an EMB can do to preserve and advance their independence in specifically if you have one in a crisis context? Hmm, interesting challenge there. Um, when it comes to your first questions, I want to be able to be as open and frank, so I don't want to sort of name shame or put sort of individual countries. So maybe I'll talk about a model that I've seen emerging out of this instead. Um, so what we tend to see is a larger multi-agency system being established. There might be six, eight, even 20, 10, 10 state agencies in there. But what I've seen in, in countries where they might have an election authority that has a smaller HQ footprint, but operating in a highly politicized environment, they, they've sort of chosen to tackle this slightly differently. So uh, one country, without naming the names, they had the following challenge. Um, they needed to, for the first time, do a biometric voter registration. But not only that, uh, they needed to uh, build off what the civil registrar had done previously. So I was facing these challenges with introducing new technology, but then also working very closely with, with a... Uh, um, for, for the, the technology end, but also for the civil registrar. So they had basically five, if not six different state agencies to work with. The civil registrar, who still claimed that that, that office had the primacy when it comes to the, the registry. You had the security entities, because now suddenly you're going to buy expensive equipment and going to be a database. So you need to think about cybersecurity. You had the treasury, because suddenly you needed to have, you know, X amount of millions of dollars to procure the biometric voter registration solution. And you had uh, procurement. And normally the procurement agency was responsible for this, but it was largely perceived as being corrupt and politicized. So how did they go about doing this? Well, they tackled it differently. They did it in bite size. They, they rather than having a large covered it all eight um, uh, sort of coordination activity. They did them individually. So they started looking at back, what's the first one we need to deal with? And that was probably two years out when we start looking at allocation of funds that needs to be changed. So they tackled the, the challenges in coordination with the treasury. And then they start looking at the civil registrar to established that they had the primacy and that was consultation with the judiciary to interpret the law and these kind of things. So they went through each separate of these ones in, in order to deal with it. Because the thinking was from the, from the uh, leadership of the EMB, if they tried to tackle them all at once, they would be overwhelmed and they would not be able to defend the independence of the commission when they had to face six, seven agencies in one go. But by doing this piecemeal, they could concentrate their, their attention to it. They could concentrate the best individuals. And they also learned how to go about this as they tackled one, two, three, and four entities of it. So that's sort of a, a nice way of, of uh, doing it. Second question, sorry, I'm being a bit long here. Um, there's no such thing as a silver bullet when it comes to these things. I mean, that, that's the boring and, 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 and dull answer. But a couple of things that I would say are, are really, really critical. It's communication, communication, communication. 
and that is communication yes of course internally within the commission or within the uh, the the task force leadership you know so they know what are we discussing how we're we sharing information internally what can be shared externally and to whom there's also needs to be internally within the commission. So the ones that, that are not immediately working with this task force, but they might have interactions with these state agencies and their representatives at a subnational level. What is it that they can do or not do when it comes to exchanges and working with, with that agency? Um, and then also, just very practical things internally within the uh, the task force is to strengthen the collaboration between the members of this one. You know, as I said before, an MOU, standard operating procedures, but also training on how they will actually work together if they're facing a crisis, if there's some some unknown risks that that uh, come to the forefront and then being faced with. I stop there. Thanks, Stefan. That's great. And I think we'll give, um, just to be fair, I'm going to give Commissioner Rogers a multi-part question. Um, and of course, you're welcome to comment on anything Stefan, um, Stefan just raised. Um, but some kind of specific questions, I think you you previewed this, this already. Um, so if you don't have anything to add, that's fine. But just we were we looking sort of probing any other examples um, where you've developed really successful, positive working relationships, like the ones you mentioned, um, what strategies or tactics um, the AC may have sort of used specifically to kind of maintain this independence, um, but also leveraging the expertise, um, the reach, the operational efficiencies, those sorts of things from the other institutions. So just if you have any other examples, and then specifically um, about any steps the AEC takes to make sure that voters and then sort of other election stakeholders understand what your mandate is vis-a-vis -vis other institutions? What kind of outreach or information um, provision do you do there? Uh, thanks, Eric. You know, really, I think uh, Stefan has been very comprehensive in his answer and has covered some of those points, but I might just maybe highlight a couple of his points by using another example. Um, you know, something that we found crept up on the AEC was the change in the electoral threat landscape that emerged after the 2016 election. And uh, we had an urgent need to work very closely with Australia's uh, security and intelligence agencies in a way that we'd never done so before. Uh, and at the start of the 2019 election, at our request, government set up a thing called the Electoral Integrity Assurance Task Force uh, and that's a whole collection of intelligence and security agencies, um, cyber security agencies, the sorts of organisations that 10 years ago, I, I would have said there's no way that the election management body would be involved with those uh, organisations. And there's a real risk with that. There's a real risk with stakeholders thinking that somehow intelligence, security agencies, government are actually involved in the running of the election. And we did a lot of thinking about that, about how to prevent that happening. And we set up a mechanism um, when that committee and those groups operate, that there's actually an air gap between that committee and those agencies and me. And the work of that committee is to provide advice to the commissioner, um, but I'm not part of the committee. They review things, they pass me information that may be relevant. And, and that's been a very successful model uh, to be able to get the benefit of having those groups make sure that we still are seen as the independent uh, election management body uh, and do it in a way that makes sense to our stakeholders. And maybe that um, brings me on to the second point, uh, Erica, about, you know, what, what's the, how do you do that? How do you reach to stakeholders and make sure they understand that? I think what Stefan said was about no silver bullet, and I absolutely agree with that. But I think that the thing I've learned, having, having now done this for a decade, is you actually need to be prepared to be unpopular. And um, sometimes, other agencies, as others have said, um, don't understand the business and they don't understand the importance of the independence of the commission. They make assumptions. They may even make public statements where they're trying to be helpful, but actually what they're doing is undercutting the independence of the organisation. You have to be very public. You have to you have to take that on publicly. You have to deal with the issue. You have to confront it. 
um, both publicly and behind the scenes. And I've had to do that with a number of different agencies, all of which was well meant, that can have a real impact on what the stakeholders think of your independence. And we've done that fairly regularly. And it's worked for us to the extent that we've now got um, a relationship with those entities. They understand where the boundaries are, their role, our role. The community, most importantly, understands what that role is as well. But that uh, takes time. And the other part of that is uh, um, somebody mentioned the issue of collaboration. I think don't expect to walk into the first meeting that you've got and for all of that to work really smoothly. It just won't. That pre-work, that collaboration is critical to getting the end result. So I might stop there. It's my little example. That's really helpful. Thank you. And I think this concept of an air gap is a really important and interesting one. We we haven't used the, the phrase specifically in the guidelines, but it is one that came up in our consultations. Um, I also like this um, this idea that you should be prepared to be unpopular. I think that's that's a useful frame to, to, to think through and to think through the consequences of these different things as you consider strategies for outreach. Um, uh, and as we mentioned before, so of course we had um, uh, EMB interlocutors in the process of doing the consultations for these, but we couldn't fit too many commissioners in the round table. Um, so I'm gonna turn to Toby. Uh, because um, he can talk a little bit about the electoral management survey, which is a survey gathering data from election authorities around the world, data that's not easily accessible via other methods. And there's some questions in there that are relevant, I know, to this topic. Um, and I, I believe this survey is still underway for this year. But are you able to share any um, highlights, initial findings that would be additive to the Global Network's work on this subject? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So thank you, first of all, Erica, um, for convening the panel and for everyone for taking part, which um, and maybe above all for congratulations to the Genocide Network for an excellent set of recommendations and guidelines, which are really, really important. And I think take things a long way forward. Um, Erica, as you're saying, the Electoral Integrity Project has been running something called the Electoral Management Survey over the course of this year. Uh, we've done this before with other, with other partners. Um, it's basically asking EMBs a series of constant and regular questions about how they're structured, some of the problems and challenges uh, that they're facing. Uh, the survey was sent out earlier on in the year, uh, in, in January, and we've had about 50 countries reply so far. So EMBs would still very much welcome and encourage you to respond. The, the information's available um, on, our, on our website. Um, but yes, there are some questions in there that are relevant to I think to, to the guidelines that I'm very happy um, to, to share. Um, I'm just going to maximize the screen just to pick just to pick a couple of um, of, of these findings. Um, so these are provisional, of course, because more responses might come in. But this is this is one question that was in the survey was, you know, the extent to which um, EMBs found their independence um, being challenged with other um, government agencies and you can see here that this is an issue um, in lots, lots large parts of the world uh, over 40% of the countries very um, are saying that they never experience these challenges but to for a significant number 14% saying they very often uh, experience uh, the, the, these challenges of some sort so it speaks to the the real experience of electoral management bodies rather than what it says on the statute book uh, what it says on the, on the constitution in terms of roles and responsibilities. Um, we then we asked them who they interact with. So I think, you know, who are the organizations that they actually interact with and how frequently do they interact with them? You can see here media and the political parties are those which are the bread and butter, as you maybe would expect. Health agencies, social media companies at the other extreme uh, tend to be those which uh, EMBs are much less frequently in contact with. What does this mean? Well, I guess maybe this is perhaps helps to re reflect in terms of thinking about the guidelines. Should be, is there more that could be said about um, about some of these actors? How EMBs could work with them, or another way of thinking about this is maybe EMBs should be working more with academics or more with civil society, uh, given that in some areas, you know, that the interactions tend to be quite infrequent. Um, 
I think one thing that the, the, the guidelines really clearly set out was is the importance of, of finance and financial independence and how important that, that capacity is uh, for an EMB to be able to, you know, to be independent, to run, to, to run elections. And the survey asks, therefore, some questions about um, their budgets, budgetary changes, and whether they feel they have sufficient resources. So this, this slide here shows um, their responses to whether they estimate over the past five years, their organization's budget has in real terms decreased, which it has for some, by over 25%. Um, remained roughly the same or has, has increased. And generally speaking, and this is in real terms, there have been increases in EMB budgets, but some that have been on the other side there. And then, on the, and then one of the following questions is, well, do you have enough resources to actually fulfill your tasks? And of course, the tasks for an EMB is going to vary depending on what its, what its precise um, role is there. And worryingly, there's I don't know, four respondents that, that said that they significant, that they strongly disagreed that they had sufficient resources. And just to put that together, you can see actually there are some countries um, that are actually strongly disagreeing they have enough resources and have seen a significant decrease in their budgetary sizes. So I think that speaks to one of the key threats to independence and, and the functioning of, of, of electoral management bodies is where you've seen those uh, declines. And just one one final thing, just 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 to, just to pull through, is we asked a whole series of questions about uh, the roles of different organisations or entities in terms of deciding how uh, the EMB functions. So um, there's a range of different organisations that might be involved in the oversight of the EMB's organisational strategy. For example, that includes executive head of government, the legislature, judiciary, civil service, and, and so on and so on. And one thing that comes through comes through very clearly, I think, and I don't think will change so much, is that uh, the executive and the legislature are clearly important. Um, even though we might have informally independent EMBs, they they clearly play an important role, um, both in terms of organisational strategy, both in terms of approval of budgets, both in but also the appointment and actually the removal of the chair and, and president. And I think that's in what on the one hand. Uh, kind of proper and correct in the democracy because it's interdependence and EMBs need to have chains of accountability to elected uh, parliamentarians, but at the same time um, also shows that risk and that danger, doesn't it? I think that um, the independence of EMBs is very kind of closely connected uh, potentially to, um, to changes in uh, election results and parliamentary politics and shifts in power there uh, could be quite a significant problem potentially. Uh, for, for, for electoral management bodies. Uh, thanks so much, Toby. Um, we could spend all day, I think, probing some of that data. It's very interesting. The, fir the first data point was really interesting um, to me, and I obviously hadn't seen it before. And um, the sort of, you know, about a quarter of respondents saying that they do encounter these types of threats for the independence, 40% not, which is great. It'll be interesting to see that over time, because as um, Stefan Octel and Commissioner Rogers have been talking about, you know, some of this is really evolving and we might not have thought about it 10 years ago, um, but it's it's sort of very real now and maybe increasingly so. And so I hope that guidelines will kind of be in place to, to prevent any slide of that 40 percent downward. Um, so on that, then let's talk a little bit in the time we have left um, for the group on how we can actually use the guidelines. Um, we've gone through this whole process. We'll have these guidelines, they'll be launched soon. How can they be useful to this community in sort of all of its parts? Um, so I'm gonna go back to Stefan and ask you, implementing organizations like IFES, but also like many others, how do you think these guidelines can be used in our work and others' work globally? Mm -hmm. Couple of things. I mean, within IFES, first of all, once we have them completed, but even prior, of course, you know, is for us that is not just something that us have been involved in developing at the headquarters knows of and are utilizing. It's much, much more important that it's being pushed out into our country uh, offices uh, that are actually doing the implementation of, of our programming, you know, so it doesn't get stuck at headquarters, but it goes out into the field as well and become an integral part there. Um, what we already 
started based on what we learned from COVID was to integrate in our EMB leadership curriculum a uh, a component dealing with this multi-agency uh, collaboration. And I think this document that Jens is now producing will be immensely beneficial. You know, we got a more solid base to stand on. It's not just what we came up with and our thinking, even though we've been trying to extract more information from EMBs and other implementing partners, but this gives it a, a, a different gravitas than otherwise would be in, in the case. Um, but besides that EMB focus, I think developing something we're not doing and certainly can, can be doing is sort of organizing workshops in the field when we're having the EMBs, the civil society, the media, public parties, and, and representatives from, from state agencies that are already involved in supporting elections and has some sort of election mandate and talk about these things. So you open about it, you public about it before you decide which model are we going to use? Is it the, uh, the enchilada with 10 agencies in there, or is it more this more selective one that we should go with, you know? So that, that's one way of doing it. And then I was also thinking, go beyond the DRG sector here. I mean, we have other TA providers that work in with the judiciary or the procurement agency, and those guys need also to understand why there might be an ask about them taking part in, in these multi-agencies. So they're not going to block it, but they might actually embrace it and promote it. So, so you know, others, other technical areas need also need to be aware of this and promote it to in their work to, to these state agencies. Yeah, some, some thoughts. Thank you, Stefan. Um, so, Octail, let's turn back to you. Um, the guidelines, as you know, recommend that civil society organizations should advocate for access to information, observe and report fairly, especially on the role played by the various actors around the electoral process, in addition to everything else that observers are, are reporting on. Um, so from your perspective, kind of same question, how do you think these guidelines can be best used by observer missions to monitor and support AMB independence? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah. I strongly believe that um, one of the best ways that uh, election observers can help um, EMBs to keep uh, independence is by using them as a kind of um, a accountable partners. Because uh, th the idea is that uh, election observation usually runs as a, a parallel uh, um, activity within uh, the elections. So, um, Usually that uh, helps uh, creating uh, trust, that helps creating legitimacy, especially for those, uh, for those results. And uh, I think that uh, that's one of the reasons that um, election observers uh, can be used as a, a parallel uh, and systematic uh, partner. Uh, not necessarily maybe in terms of financial accountability, because there are other agencies that can help to that matter. But uh, I strongly believe that uh, by working together, but not uh, within the idea or within the atmosphere of EMBs, is uh, how election observers can help uh, EMBs to keep independence. And uh, lastly, in, in especially in, in those highly, not just complex, but in massive countries, I think the, the challenge is the, to focus in those areas, uh, critical areas, uh, politically, uh, highly violent, or maybe uh, more complex than the, the rest of the regions to focus uh, highly in uh, monitoring and uh, especially evaluating how uh, something I described before, how um, in different contexts, uh, things happen in different ways. So by uh, matching what is uh, written in the law and uh, looking at what happens in the ground, I think, uh, and reporting, of course, I think that's the best way to help uh, uh, EMBs to keep independence. Great. Thanks so much, Octail, for that point. 
Um, and I think, you know, we've we've heard a, a bit from practitioners and a little bit from Toby, but in the spirit of um, sort of our, our setting here, which is with the Electoral Integrity Project, which just has a wealth of scholars doing a lot of interesting research um, on this subject matter, I'm going to shift back to Toby for a couple last questions. Um, so the first one, I'm going to quote your own words, um, uh, or your own writing, I should say. Um, so in <laughs> Good, good stuff. Uh, last year, in a special issue of the South African Journal of International Affairs, um, you noted in sort of an introduction to the special issue that the future trajectory of democracy is not predetermined um, and it's contingent on the actions of many actors, but with EMBs as the fulcrum. Um, and you also find that a limitation of the existing literature is that it and I think we find this in the practitioner space as well, is that it focuses um, sort of mostly on EMB typologies categorizing them, thinking about their different types of independence. But, um, and to quote you, often pays little attention to the equally important shifting environment and strategic situation within which the EMBs operate. So with all that preamble, um, <laughs> what role do you think that Gensei and these guidelines can play in sort of helping to broaden this understanding? Yes, I think it, it can be enormously important. And as you quite rightly point out, pointed out, initially, uh, academics and, and practitioners for a long time were just thinking about those typologies, weren't they? Independent, governmental, uh, or, or mixed. Um, and I argued a couple of years ago in, in a book on comparative electoral management that a better way potentially of thinking about it is in terms of, in terms of actors, resources, and tactics. So actors, there's lots of actors actually involved in delivering elections. It's, um, electoral management bodies, but it's all those other organizations that um, colleagues have, have, have spoken about already. Um, and they have resources, whether it's legal resources or financial resources or ability or staff or whatever it is that's important. Um, but it's always contingent on, on tactics, it's actually using those tactics um, successfully. Um, you know, I'm here in the UK, one, um, one organisation, Manchester United, for example, have got amazing players, they've got lots of resources, but for some reason the men's team don't seem to be doing particularly well, and it's, it's partly potentially uh, because of tactics. And what this kind of, uh, that the guidelines gives everybody is a, is a set of tactics in, in a way, it is, it is a set of strategies that um, electoral management bodies, but also all the related agencies that play an important role in democracy can pick up. Uh, and they can they can run with and they can deliver these and, and, and work those on, on practice. So I think I think it really is a very important uh, sort of document and, and a step forward uh, in terms of thinking about how independence and interdependence really really functions. Um, so it, it is a very important document. So let me ask you one last question. Although our panelists are welcome to chime in if you have thoughts on this as well, um, or other mm. panelists. But um, what types of kind of scholarly research do you think that would be needed that you or your colleagues might might undertake that would be helpful on this subject like what what hasn't been studied enough do you think well i really i welcome i uh, want to hear from the emb as, as well on this because i think what they find useful is what's useful in a way um, I think the electoral management survey data, as I say, that's available on the EIP website, it's been uh, available for a few years, hasn't been as widely used by academics as it could be. So I'd encourage everyone to, to, to look at that and, and to use it uh, for, for studies. I think country case studies would be particularly important though, um, as the, the guideline sets out, you know, as I say, tactics or strategies that electoral management bodies or other partners can use, it'd be really useful to, to have case studies of, of when these are, are put into action, what happens? Does it, does it work? Uh, does it not work? Under what conditions is it more successful um, that, than, than others and that other conditions? In a way, the guidelines sort of provide a uh, sort of a EMB playbook in a way, which is kind of comparable to like, the autocrat's playbook. So it'd be really useful, I think, to see how these strategies uh, can be used in, in applied cases um, and to, to help generalize from those. Thanks, Toby. Um, do Before we switch over to the kind of audience Q&A, um, Octail, Stefan, Commissioner Rogers, do you have any final thoughts or on that or on anything else that you wanted to add? Maybe just one pointer in building up what Commissioner Rogers said and, and, and what uh, Toby just mentioned, and that is sort of 
study of this dynamics when it comes to this multi-agency leadership, you know, uh, so we have a better understanding what, what's, what's the model? How do we go about preparing and reducing, you know, the need for uh, EMBs to, pl to, to be the bad cop and, 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 and bring the big stick in there, you know, or when there are issues in there, how do, how do you deal with that? It's, it's, I would imagine, quite different from, from when you're working within a unitary one entity organization compared to when you're trying to merge and blend uh, leaders that comes from, from different organizational culture and have different backgrounds and expectations on this, you know, how do we ensure that that sort of induction into to establish something like this that might be temporary in nature, but be extremely important and under enormous political scrutiny, that that it goes as smoothly as possible. That would be fascinating to, to learn more about that. Yeah, I, I would say just uh, looking at these threats and uh, all the rest of the things we've discussed, um, I'm not necessarily uh, in the long term, I'm not necessarily uh, but for EMBs, because also there are slots for innovation and uh, slots for uh, production or thinking themselves in a, a, a very different way. So we, I, I'm not ex exactly sure that we see we've got to see these things as um, entirely negative, despite uh, this uh, uh, democratic decline. Thank you, Arteal. It's Stefan, Commissioner Rogers, any last thoughts you wanted to add before we move to our questions and answer? No, look, I think that um, the other panelists have handled that really well. And I, I, I do like that idea, the ideas that were expressed during the, what do we do with this thing? Um, just reflecting a little though on Stefan's last point. Not, it's not appropriate today to talk about it. There is something though about the selection and preparation of the heads of these agencies. Um, and what we need to do to support them. And the academic research that, you know, is being behind what we're talking about today is so good, but making sure that it's known, used and actioned, particularly by new appointees is, is critical. Um, and uh, I wish I had an answer for that, Rick, I don't, but it's something we need to consider. <laughs>